So my story goes with me being in the US. As I mentioned before, I was an international student. I graduated from high school in Peru, in my home country, and moved to the US um, to go to college. So as an international student, you must comply and follow certain um, rules uh, that the US immigration you know, system gives you. So this story is actually quite, when it happened, it, it was really devastating for me because I was young and also very much scared of anything that had to do with legal document or legal anything. So um, when this happened, this completely triggered my anxiety and of course depression. So I still remember this uh, moment in my life as something that it brings me a lot of good memories, lessons, but also a little bit of, you know, paranoia still. And I still can't believe I went through that. So um, when I was in college, I was in my, I want to say sophomore year, which is the second year in, you know, at university. Um, and I had an emergency at home in Peru. I was called by my mom and she told me that I needed to come back to my house, to Peru. It was a personal matter, a personal problem, um, you know, that my family was facing here in Peru. And in a way I was needed, not necessarily for me to do something, it was more like support you know so i decided to pause my studies and come back this was a fall semester so this was somewhere between i want to say july uh, i'm sorry august and september somewhere in between and and so every time you need to travel or you need to do something uh, regarding travels as an international student you sort of have to report it to your advisor at school. Um, and so I went to my advisor, talked to her, told her what was going on at home and told her that I needed to pause my studies, my fall semester and resume them somewhere next year, some, you know, the following year. Um, to which she responded very nicely. She helped me out, filled out some documents that I guess she was required to do so. And just, you know, told me that I legally was able to stay in the US until I was able to settle all my, um, you know, all the things I needed to do before I left. Because keep in mind, as a, as a student, in a new country, in a new city, really. Um, you're renting, you're, uh, you know, you're paying for uh, insurance, you're paying for everything, really. So for me to pause my life and then leave for what we're going to be five to six months, maybe, um, I needed to settle everything at home, yeah, in the US, you know, my my current home i needed to for example um either give up my apartment or find somebody who would like maybe rent it from me like i you know it was a whole process so for me to figure out what i was gonna do with my belongings and everything it took me a few days in fact it took me a couple weeks so she told me that and you know after me officially uh, quitting that semester, um, I had a specific amount of days or weeks to stay, uh, to remain in the US before I had to leave, get out. Um, and this is where my problems began. So as I mentioned, you know, uh, giving up my apartment, moving my things, putting them in a locker, uh, in a, you know, what do you call a rental locker? Is that how they call them? Yeah, like, a, what's the word I'm looking for? Starch. There you go. <laughs> I went blank for a second. So uh, while, you know, putting my things in a, in, a, in a storage and just, you know, 
basically arranging my life in in the US took me time. It took me about two weeks or so, two weeks and a half, which was fast, honestly. Um, so I noticed that after the after two weeks, I noticed that, you know, I I don't know why I had the feeling that I was running out of time and I had this big uh, intuish, intuitive moment, I guess, that uh, something was going on, you know, like I actually wondered how much longer I could stay in the US, I still needed a few more days, blah, blah, blah. So I went to my advisor and she told me, no, everything's good, you, you still have a few days, but if you wanted to have maybe couple a couple more weeks, you know, to finish arranging your things, um, you could leave and enter as a tourist, you know, that way you are sort of fixing your legal status. To which, of course, I completely, you know, responded, okay, that sounds good. I mean, I don't need that much longer, but I do need a few more days. And I bought a ticket to the place that was the closest to Miami because I lived in Miami which was the Bahamas and you know bought a a ticket for like to stay there for like maybe two three days maybe three four I think actually um and then come back I did that I went to the Bahamas stay there for about I think it was like four days in total I made friends there I went solo by the way this was a solo trip uh, because the intention was not for me to really go for leisure. It was more for gaining more time. <laughs> so I am in the Bahamas and I still had fun. I met friends there. I made friends um, and, you know, still got to visit a few places. Uh, overall, it was just a good stay. So when the time to return, you know, when that day arrived, um, you actually... Uh, you know, at the Bahamas, you have to go through customs before you fly. Normally, when you enter a country, you go through customs when you are in the country, you know, when you are, your flight arrives. Um, but in the Bahamas, you actually do that before. So before you go and, you know, um, go to your gate and everything, you actually have to go through customs. So I go through customs, they flag my passport, and I knew something was going on. And they send me to a room. I got nervous and mind you at this point I was maybe I what how old was I it was 20 13 I think so I must have been 22 or so yeah I didn't start college right away I I you know I took a gap year and then I traveled so I really I was 22 I think um and so I was really young I was really scared and I go into this room which is filled with offices like mini offices and lots of U.S. officers you know and there are like people that are still are waiting that were also sent to the room and they all look sketchy and I was like what am I doing here so um this was at like 9 a.m in, in in the morning so it was pretty early and i was confident that by uh, by the afternoon i was gonna be back in miami little did i know what was gonna happen <laughs> so i'm waiting there one hour passes and i'm already freaking out because my flight i'm gonna lose my flight I'm, i was basically I, I had already lost my flight at that point because I had to be at my gate by that time. So uh, I start asking questions and nobody's helping me. They're all like, you need to sit down and wait. And I see people coming in and out, everybody that was waiting before I got there, they were all gone. The people that came after me, they were all gone and I was still waiting and I saw my phone and it was already noon. And I'm like, something's going on. So I, and also I had that morning, I didn't have breakfast, so I was pretty weak, pretty, you know, like with a lack of energy and I'm just starting to really lose my shit. So, of course, you're 
inside an office an immigration office so you cannot make phone calls you cannot be like recording and i wanted to avoid any problems that you know uh could come out of behaving weirdly you know or doing something out of the usual so i just stayed still and just asked one more question like when am i going to be interviewed or what's going to happen and they're like no 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 you need to sit down and wait what the hell were they waiting for i don't know i kid you not i had to sit there they had no bathrooms no vending machines no nothing i was just sitting there and i think one officer offered me water and that was it and i wanted to cry my ass off but for some reason i was like no 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 you need to remain calm and just something's going on but it's gonna get solved that's what i kept thinking of course your girl has depression and also anxiety so that starts kicking in, especially anxiety obviously so that starts kicking in and i start moving very i i guess to people it would seem like i'm very you know you could tell that i was having sort of like a panic attack at the moment so i started moving like this started chaining legs i started biting my nails which i rarely do i don't do that anymore and and so they noticed that i was starting to to get nervous and one officer asks me are you okay why are you being like that and i'm like i'm sorry but i actually um i can have panic attacks because one i am claustrophobic and i feel like i'm being locked right now and two nobody's talking to me so i'm right i'm like freaking out right now um so i think they started feeling bad for me at this point it was like 3 p.m that's how long i was waiting and they were like okay well you know we're we're just they ended up telling me why I was waiting. I had to be interviewed by some officer that was not there. His shift started at like four o'clock. So he, he had like an afternoon shift. And, and so I had to wait for him. Nobody told me that. They just told me you have to wait and wait and wait and wait. So I look at the officer and I'm like, wait, so you mean I have to wait another hour to talk to this person? Why don't you just tell me what's going on? They're like, no, because we're not supposed to, like, we're, we're just, I mean, they never really give you answers. They just tell you very broadly what's going on, you know. So they told me we're not supposed to um, talk about anything regarding students. So it's actually him who has to take care of this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, obviously, it's something about my permit. So I wait for this guy at this point. I'm really weak. I'm sitting in my... In the same chair that I had been sitting for like I don't know how many hours. Um, I swear it, I'm so weak that I'm about to pass out. And I think I told them, you know, I think I'm gonna pass out. And that's when actually they started feeling bad for me and started giving me water. Um. So I think I was like falling asleep, you know, but that gap I think passed really fast for me because I was like. All I kept thinking was like, he's coming, you know, he's on his way, he's on his way. But then eventually I see a guy coming through and I'm like, I knew it was him. And, you know, he sees me, he looks at them, they talk about me, of course, in his office, and then they call me. Finally, I get up, go into this office who's e that's even scarier because there is nothing. Like the four walls are empty. There is a table and there is a thing to take my fingerprints, right? Is that what it's called? And then there is the officer with a computer, paper, a printer. And I'm like, what is going on? So I sit down and I look at him and he's like, obviously they need to remain neutral. They can't be empathetic or anything. I don't know. That's what I, um, I assume because they were all very the opposite of empathetic with me <laughs> so i sit down and he looks at me and he starts asking me questions from like who is my father my mom's names last names date of birth just basic information about me and my life in peru and i'm like why and of course i answer but then i think there was a moment of like silence and I asked if I may ask 
what is the reason I'm being, I'm being kept here and why are you asking me all these questions? And after like 25 minutes of like interrogating me, they go, well, it's because you actually overstayed your visa and this is a red flag for us. So for you to fly to the Bahamas and then try to fly back into the US having you know overstayed your visa that's just weird you know and and then after you know months later i was just speculating with my friends and they all had like really crazy you know stories or you know speculating stories about why i would i may have looked very suspicious i guess people fly into the bahamas to do a bunch of things like to traffic things or try to bring in things into the u.s or whatever and i don't know why they thought i was the person to do that so he you know obviously i started explaining why i was doing that and i told them that my advisor at school who i was so pissed at had given me those instructions actually those recommendations so they, of course, had to call my school to verify that information. And, of course, somebody must have talked to them because finally they sort of started believing me because at the beginning they all looked, like, looked at me like I was a big, fat liar. And, you know, finally I was starting to be treated like a person. So I remember, you know, after all of that is settled... The office, I'm still in this room. The officer, after, it must have been an hour, I think, of phone calls and me waiting and waiting and waiting. And so after that, he comes in the room and finishes asking me questions, you know, random questions like, what are you going to do? Like, how much longer are you going to stay? After that, how what are you going to do in Peru? Blah, blah, blah. So after that, he tells me, well, even though we have cleared your reasons and purpose of visit and everything, you still have overstayed your visa, which was the initial reason why I was being flagged. Because I had overstayed, I think I had like two weeks and I had overstayed like two more days or something. And that's how crazy I think, you know, my grandmother used to say that I don't know if this is this happens to everybody, but usually women tend to have this like sixth sense that something's going on. And I remember when I had when the two weeks passed and I was still in Miami, I was like, something's going on. Like I was feeling very anxious. I knew like I need needed to get out. And that's what prompt prompted me to go see my advisor again. And I think had I not done that, I think I would have continued staying in Miami for another week. And I think it would have been even worse for me to come to Peru and try to enter again. You know, it would have ruined completely my records. Um, and so he told me, you know, you still overstayed two days. And that is already like, that's already like breaking the law. So we have to cancel your visa. And he grabs a huge uh, stamp as big as my palm and just freaking cancels my student visa, which can be hard to get. And I'm like looking at my passport, looking at him and I'm like, what did you just do? Like, that's just like hundreds of dollars of, you know, application process, time and everything. And I'm like, that's my ticket. That's my entrance to the U.S. What did you just do, you know? So I start crying. He looks at me and finally he, I don't know, I guess his empathy kicked in. And he's like, I'm so sorry. I need to do this. But we're going to allow you to stay in the Bahamas for another. Like, I was still able to stay in the Bahamas as a tourist, you know, but... What they were saying is that they were going to allow for me to stay in the Bahamas to um, apply for another student visa there at the, you know, U.S. Embassy in the Bahamas in Nassau and get a new student visa with a clear record, clean record, and then use that 
to re-enter the U.S. Because the one that got canceled was basically tainted. Like, it was on, it was already in my records that, that that visa had already been involved in some type of, like, illegal activity. That's what I got. That's what was explained to me. So it was kind of shocking, but at the same time, it was like a relief. You know, it's like, okay, I'm able to do this. I'm going to do it. And he was like, hey, you didn't break any laws. Your school confirmed it. It was more on their side. So just explain that to the consul and you should be able to get another one. And, you know, he just said that no baby, but actually applying, well, the application process is, you know, 15 minutes, but you have to pay for that. You need to still show proof of funds, uh, you know, references, uh, you know, all these things that in the moment I didn't have. So, of course, I had to wait another. So this was like a Sunday. <laughs> no, actually, it was a Saturday. The next day was a Sunday. I didn't have any of the documents I needed to show, you know, to go to the embassy to my appointment. Uh, I, you know couldn't pay anywhere the fee to actually access the, the appointment so I had to basically lose a day and then on Monday I woke up and I was like called my parents they were freaking out they were crying thinking you know at, and at this point I you know had gone to the Bahamas with a budget to just stay three days or four days I think and of course me irresponsible Gabby spent it all vacationing thinking that everything was going to be fine by the time i was like at the airport i had already like i was pretty much out of my money i only had a hundred bucks because i was pretty limiting like i used to limit myself with budgets you know like i would be like this is your budget that's it and i wouldn't allow myself to to have access to more money otherwise i would spend it so literally my budget in my account i had limited myself to have only like that money which had or i had already spent so in my debit card it wasn't even a credit card you know i had only like a hundred bucks remaining so i basically had only one night stay in the bahamas you know um at a random hotel so it was pretty bad my parents were so worried it was a sunday uh, you know, when I woke up the next day, it was a Sunday, so they couldn't really wire me money. Everything would take like 24 hours. And, you know, I was eating Subway for like two days, I remember. And I was crying my ass off in the hotel saying, you know, why the hell did this happen to me? And my mom actually flew in. She was so desperate. I mean, at this point, they thought, you know, I was still young, so they thought, you know, what's gonna happen to my girl she's stranded in a foreign country blah 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 so my mom flew in brought me the documents that i needed and i applied that same day i think it was a yeah it was monday i applied for my, my appointment paid my hundreds of dollars for the the appointment uh took my photo there in the in bahamas in the bahamas um i had to use the one good shirt that I had because everything was like very some you know of course summer so it was very informal clothing but I had brought one shirt that was like a you know like an actual work shirt but I used it you know I would like use it with shorts for like a an evening out or something so I used that one shirt to take the photo and I got an appointment for like two days from that day so that was like Wednesday or Thursday, I think. So I still had two more days to kill in the Bahamas. I would wake up. I think it wasn't even two days. I think it was more. Oh my God, I think it was more because I remember waking up like three consecutive days going to the beach. I had already befriended the people at the beach in the in Nassau. I would go to church because the hotel was here and the church was across the street. I still have pictures that I posted, I think, on my instagram um uh, i even helped i befriended this family that would sell coconuts you know and at the beach so i like befriended them because i was so bored in the hotel there was nothing to do i had already seen everything i had to see so i befriended them i even sold coconuts 
coconuts. <laughs> I, I always have an issue pronouncing <laughs> coconuts. Um, I did all kinds of things that just locals do by befriending them. And, you know, I was lucky enough to meet the right people because I also know that, know that Nassau can be dangerous, especially at nighttime, especially for girls, especially for young tourists, young female tourists. So I was very lucky. I think I was being protected by divine sources or something because um yeah when i talked to later you know to my friends and everything people that had been in also and t told me their stories you know not so pretty stories around you know like crime whatever uh, i was pretty shocked and i was lucky enough that nothing happened to me i was like walking around late afternoon just going for walks you know meeting people and trusting people you know um, I was pretty lucky. So, um, so yeah, a few days have, you know, passed and finally the day of my appointment arrived and I woke up really early, went to the embassy, which was like only two blocks away. Everything's so close in Nassau. And, um, and of course at the appointment, they also made me wait because I was like a very extraordinary case. And the person that took care of me, you know, that was in charge of interview interviewing me. Um, he also took his time. I had to explain everything again for the second time. I spoke so much during those days, <laughs> so much explaining to do. And he also made me wait. He called my school. My school confirmed again what I was saying, verified the information. And then finally, they gave me another visa. So I was like, thank God. Uh, and the best thing t is that they told me that I could get my passport back the very next day in the morning. So I was even happier because here in Peru, you actually have to wait. You have to wait, I think, a week or so to get your passport back. So for me, that was like a big yes. So that day I went to my, my hotel, packed my things, bought a ticket for the next day in the afternoon, hoping that everything would go, that nothing else would get in my way between that night and the next morning. Um, and so the next day I picked up my passport and just took a taxi to the airport. And the same officers that stopped me saw me. They knew who I was. I think at this point, everybody in town knew who I was. I was the girl that got stranded in the Bahamas. Um, and yeah, they let me in. And it was just like a, such a surreal. I started crying the moment I got in the, like, the aircraft, you know, because staying in the Bahamas was not easy. Everything was so expensive. And even though my mom flew in that gap i think it was two days that i waited for her the first night i had money to stay in a hotel oh and i didn't share this so, so the first night i had money so i went back to the hotel where i was staying i paid for that night because in the bahamas but god forbid you don't have the money right there they will kick you out you know and of course, as a 22 year old girl, I still, you know, I wasn't re using credit cards. I was very immature when it came to personal finances. So um, I was all over the place and my mom, you know, my dad, everybody was trying to get me into like learning and managing my money wisely. But so that was a big lesson for me. So like I said, I, would, I only went to the Bahamas saying, hey, this is the amount of money that you have. You better not spend it all. And that's what you're coming, you know, that's what you're using to bring your butt over here back, you know, into the U.S. So I didn't have like emergency funds, which was a big now. Oh my God, what, whoever is watching, if you go to a foreign country, you should always have an emergency fund somewhere that you have access to in case something happens. So the first night I went to the hotel, I had the money to check in. I think it was 80 bucks. So I had like 20 bucks left, which I used the next day to buy a subway and like something else and water, I think. It was it was so fucking stupid. Um but the next day I didn't have money for that night. 
and this is the crazy i mean this is so crazy i was in my hotel it was time to check out it was noon and i remember i was crying i was like my mom was so desperate she was trying to have a friend or somebody from miami wire me money send me money but something was going on i think it, was, it had something to do with being sunday that everything was delayed like it wouldn't arrive into my account and, until monday morning or something and this hotel actually any hotel because i didn't have a credit card they wanted me to pay up front and i didn't have the money so i remember i was crying i was like what am i gonna say so i go downstairs talk to the manager and she just says no and I'm begging her. I'm like, my mom's going to be here tomorrow. I'm going to have money. Like, I'll show you my emails, text messages, whatever you want. Take my laptop as a, what do you call? Like, a, a not, I don't even know the word right now. But, you know, uh, just take it as, as leverage, I guess, um, to show that I'm, I'm going to pay you back. You know, I, this is my laptop. It's, it, it was a MacBook brand new, you know, at the moment. So it was like, this is my life right now. So I'm not, I'm not lying to you. And she just had no empathy. She was like, no. I still remember that face. I remember her clearly. She was like blonde, probably mid fifties, blue eyes. The prettiest blue eyes, but meanest because she would just look at my face and be like, no, you're getting out of here. If you're not paying, you're out. And I'd be shaking and crying. And of course, I don't need to mention that my anxiety at this point is like through the roof. I don't even know how I kept myself together. You know, like I still remember being like very vulnerable and like desperate. And I'm like, well, that's it. I'm going to sleep tonight in the streets in the Bahamas. God knows what's going to happen. So... I guess the front desk ladies were watching me and observing me. They were like this, the nicest women ever. And I wish I could find this woman and like, I don't know, give her a big hug because I don't even know what I could give her. So I go back to my hotel and I'm like, well, that's it. You got to grab your bag and go somewhere. I don't even know where. Um... And all of a sudden, and mind you, I'm like in my bed sitting and I'm praying. I'm not a big, I'm not big on religion. I grew up in a Catholic household, but I, have, I was never religious. In fact, I was the opposite. So, you know, for me to be sitting there and crying and praying and talking to my grandmother who was already dead, you know, I was like... It, it was surreal, you know, I, I didn't think I would ever be in a position like that. And somebody knocks on the door and I'm like, well, that's it. Grab your bag, grab your backpack, you're out. Open the door and there is this beautiful, tall, super tall lady with like shaved hair. You know, like she had, like she had very short hair. She was, she was Bahamian right from the Bahamas is that how you pronounce it I'm making so many mistakes in this story sorry um so she had like black very beautiful skin like everything about her was just like a goddess you know like African goddess that's what it looked like to me very like she, she was just like so aesthetically pleasing and she had like beautiful makeup and she had her uniform and I look at her and I'm like, I know I have to get out. And she's like, have you eaten? That's the first thing she asked me. And it makes me want to cry right now because honestly, that was like the most empathetic in the whole trip, you know? Have you eaten? And I'm like, e I bought a Subway. That's all I could say, you know? She's like, okay, I'll send you food. And I'm like, well, I'm supposed to leave. She's like, no, don't worry. I'm paying for you. And I'm like, oh. I literally just stood there and she's like, I'm paying for you. Don't worry. Are your parents going to be here tomorrow? And I'm like, my mom is supposed to fly in tomorrow and send me money. And and she goes like, well, don't worry. Everything's going to get sorted. You know, just stay here. I'll send food for you and I'll take care of the bill for tonight. Don't worry. You can pay me tomorrow at whatever time you find convenient. And she looks at me and she gives me a hug. And I just felt like 
I don't know. It was like an angel was taking care of me that I just bursted into tears. She was just holding me. And she's like, it'll be fine, you know? And she just goes away and I'm closing the door very slowly. And I'm like, I cannot believe what is happening right now. Like, I think that's, she was the representation of what kindness is in a person and I just like I wish I could find her you know I wish I could talk to her and express my gratitude because I've never seen kindness like that ever and I don't think I will ever you know um and of course you know when I had the money I went to the lobby try to pay her in person but she wasn't working that day or something happened so I only saw her once again and it was like the night before I was checking out and she just gave me that usual beautiful smile that she had like pearly white teeth and just like you know just full of like grace I mean it really is shocking how a person can you know represents so much or have them that, that much good energy i don't know so yeah i i you know i paid her my mom was with me when i when i gave her the money she wasn't there i put it in an envelope you know for her and then when i said goodbye she just told me good luck with everything everything's gonna be okay you know and and that's how it went you know so yeah that's my story that's a crazy story. Um, I don't know how long I ended up staying. I have to count. I have to go check my passport. I don't know how many days I stayed. I think in total, I must have, must have stayed like two plus weeks. And in those days, I felt so many emotions. I honestly, my anxiety was kicking in and I... All I could do really was just to calm myself. I meditated a lot every morning. I would like meditate at night. I would journal my emotions so that I wouldn't think of crazy ideas. Um, I was very depressed. So, you know, at this point I was talking to a therapist in, at school. So like, it's not like I could afford to pay a private, you know, therapist that could call me like 24 seven and be like, how are you, you know? So I had to like journal a lot. So I think the best way that you can um, carry yourself when you're having an anxiety or a panic attack or an anxiety moment, you know, is to really try to breathe and not freak out because I think that's when you run out of good ideas, you know. Instead of being in a problem-solving mode, you go into like a panic mode and that's not good. So I just kept thinking of like my end goal, you know, like that's okay. This is going to happen. This has to happen. Like whatever thoughts I had, I would just write them down and, and just get rid of that energy and those thoughts and just focus on the end goal, you know. So um, that really journaling, breathing like breathing work you know workouts and just being focused on what you need to do I think that can get you out of that moment that anxiety a panic attack whatever you want to call it you know um it can it can help so maybe my story will give many lessons <laughs> to people because I feel like there's so much to learn from this now I remember this story with a lot of, I think, love. I don't know, I just remember, even though, you know, it's it had lots of bad moments, I still, I always think of this lady, I always think of the good things, of the good people in the Bahamas that helped me. So it's just, you know, a good story to tell. But I hope you'll get some lessons from, from this, so... Yeah, I'll be back for another story next time.